All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's the top of the hour, 11.30 on January 21st on Thursday, so very exciting. Just gonna do a quick uh, check with Kasia. Kasia, can you see everything okay and hear me okay? Loud and clear. Perfect. Michelle, can you hear us okay and see the screen? All good. Perfect, all right. We'll, we'll go ahead and get started. We had a big exciting day yesterday. So the 46th president came in for inauguration, Mr. Joe Biden, and uh, going over the 100-day plan looks very exciting and very promising. So very exciting to watch yesterday. Uh, today, please feel free to eat lunch at home. So get comfy, relax, sit down and enjoy. Make sure you turn the volumes up on your, your tablets, your computer, your smartphone or any other device you're using today. The video today will be recorded, so we'll go back to, to read it, or sorry, to, to watch it as well. And that will be emailed to everyone a little bit later today, this afternoon. Little Ariana knew she's now three and three quarters. 2020 just flew by. She has grown like a weed. She's 43 pounds and uh, 41 inches. So she's, Falls asleep in the car. She, uh, I got to take her out of the garage and put her on the shoulders. You can definitely feel those those 40 plus pounds. So she's getting heavier, and just tons of energy throughout the house every day, and just wears mom and I out. And we got a, a little boy coming here, end of May, early June. We just went to Kaiser last Friday, and he was giving us the thumbs up right here. So the doctor says he's got big hands and big feet. So he's definitely a Sadowski boy. Uh, calendar of events, everyone should have uh, one of these right there in front of them. Or, and if you don't, it's gonna be on the handout side, on the right-hand side on the control panel. There'll be three items in there, uh, calendar of events for 2021, uh, Kasia's bio, our guest speaker here in a few minutes, as well as today's uh, PowerPoint slides, if anyone would like a copy of those. Our next event is gonna be April 21st, same time at 11.30, uh, same channel here. We're going to have a couple of guest speakers, uh, bond managers, going to be going over tax-free muni bonds, very important. And then on the back here, there's a notes page. Please feel free to take notes while we're going over everything. And then we're going to go over the market recap of 2020, what happened, and what Casey and Asimark see moving forward in 2021. And as always, we're going to have a Q&A on the right-hand side there's a little box that says chat box, type in your question, we will write, we will answer those right at the end. And just a, a quick reminder how we all work together. So as clients, you know, we're on this journey called retirement, we're on this journey called life, and we, we face many obstacles. And there's five key areas, here where the mouse is pointing, uh, that we need to make sure we're managing. You know, number one is cash flow. If we're still working, you know, even if we're retired, making sure our, our bills are getting paid, paying our mortgage if there's still a mortgage, you know, any insurance and, and stuff like that, making sure everything's paid for, making sure our charities are funded, our kids are going to university, grandkids are going to university. Number two is making sure we're managing your investments, you know, to your risk and then to your needs that you want us to invest to socially. It's very important. And making sure you're not taking on too much risk. We all had a nice reminder last March, you know, less than a year ago when the market dropped over 35% in 18 days. And now we're, you know, we're doing very well. Market has reached new boundaries. The third item we want to make sure we take care of is your tax. We all need to pay taxes. We want to make sure we pay the right amount and not a penny more. And we also want to make sure we have adequate health coverage you know, while we're working, even when we retire, we go on to Medicare as well as looking into long-term care insurance, God forbid we have to go to a nursing home, assisted living, or adult daycare. And finally, we wanna make sure we overcome the, the estate plan, making sure we're putting our affairs and needs in order, getting the will, the trust, power of attorney, and healthcare directives, you know, as we want for our wishes, you know, preferably before we're looking down from the clouds. And as advisors and wealth managers, we help put this plan together and make sure we stay on top and keep you organized. So we monitor this stuff and together, 
you know, it's a partnership. We're going to help you overcome this. You know, life doesn't just give us a, a straight line. It throws in many curves and, and many pylons. So we need to adjust and basically move accordingly. But together we can overcome this. Our guest speaker today comes from Asimark. Asimark is located uh, right here in the East Bay of California and, and Concord. They manage a little bit more than 67 billion in assets and they actually manage 100% of people's money on the call today for all of our clients. So we hire the best, they know exactly what they're doing. Casey, have, uh, Casey and I have known each other for over five years and Casey in the past, uh, she's worked with Global Financial, she's worked with Jackson National, Jackson National, as well as JP Morgan. So she's an expert in what she does. And with no further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and bring on Casey Samuel. And if everyone can bear with me for a few seconds, I'm just gonna change presenter to Kezia and hit OK, share main screen. What are you looking at right now, Nathan? I'm looking at what the heck happened, yeah, in 2020, so it's perfect, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Uh, since I can't see what you all of you are seeing, I'm just going to make sure. Let's, we're just going to fast forward one slide. Are you able to see that? Perfect. Yep. Rotation. Well, good morning. Perfect. Good morning to all of you. Nathan, thank you for having me join all of you. I remember fondly seeing all of your happy, smiling faces in that beautiful Berkeley Country Club, and I look forward, hopefully, one day to recreating that in person. But nonetheless, Welcome to my home as well here in 2021. I say this uh, in, in humor, but I've had more Zoom visitors than actual physical visitors in the last year and a half or so as we've all gone remote. Nonetheless, I hope everyone is staying safe, healthy, and sane in these uh, trying times as we have seen. But let me see if I can, in the next 20 minutes or so, talk about what the heck happened in 2020. I think, you know, it was a year where all of us slowed down, but watched the world zoom past us and all these events unfolded in such a short period of time that it was very hard to digest. So in the markets, what took place? What were the key drivers? And more importantly, looking forward, what are some of the opportunities and risks that lie? And as always, I welcome any and all questions at the end. Let's make this a robust conversation. Are those fair games to get started there, Nathan? That sounds perfect. Thank you. Okay. Let's get going then. Let's take a look. We're going to start with the fourth quarter, meaning the last three months of 2020. A very quick reflection on some of where the key market indices performed. I want us to take our eyes to the top. And the way you're going to follow this is you're going to look at the black line and think of that as the peg, which we represent a globally diversified stock and bond index. In the fourth quarter, as you can see, the stock and bond combination generated nearly 10% in return, 10.2 to be precise. Given everything that had happened, this is a stellar return in just three months of the year. What helped? Things to the left of it in green are the things that did better than that black benchmark. And then things to the right of it in orange did lower than the benchmark, so to speak. So think one is, did better, one did less better. So you can see here the fourth quarter, the last three months of the year, it was all about risk. It feels like ages ago, but as the news of the vaccine came through, it was finally that the market could see ahead and say the economic recovery could now broaden as a result of it. So global stocks, commodities, things that were struggling for some parts of the year started to do really well. In that environment where risk type of investments do better, you can see bonds and some of those risk management strategies that we incorporate into portfolios took a back seat, no surprise. Investors got comfortable, they said, I'm ready to take some risks, and we saw those investments do well. But what we don't see is when you take your eye to the bottom left-hand side, and now we're going to compare how the different types of stocks did in just the last three months. 
This is very important. In the last three months with that vaccine news offering hope of a broader economic recovery other than technology, which is where we have seen all the returns come from. But the fourth quarter, we saw a new leadership emerge. We saw smaller stocks as shown by U.S. small caps. Look at the whopping 31% it generated. So just when you lose hope, the market still over returns. And this is a classic reminder that trying to know exactly quarter by quarter which investments are going to do well is a very hard game to chase. And as such, being diversified is a classic reminder for all of us that it's impossible to know the trend and how markets are going to behave. But nonetheless, smaller stocks generated the strongest returns. And then guess what? Emerging market stock also came up in three months, generated nearly 20% in returns. Why? Again, as the recovery began, the world could see hope. And as such, things that had been beaten down in early parts of the year started to emerge as winners in the last three months. So emerging market stocks, meeting stocks in China and India, really started to recover. And that's what you're seeing in that 19.8%. But I want us to link our eye to something else. You want to look at one index in here. It's called US DVDs. And it's not the DVDs you pop in to watch a video, but rather dividend stocks. Dividend stocks in general have suffered not only in the last three months, is what you're seeing here, but in general. In 2020, if your portfolio is leaning for income and leans into stocks that have historically paid dividends, like the blue chip companies that have always held steady, that did not stay in favor in 2020. 2020 was all about the sexy growth meaning technology stocks. All of you live in California, you're very familiar with some of them that are locally based there. But that's what caught investors' attention in 2020. Meanwhile, the blue chip dividend paying stocks, the steady old boring stocks, did not do well. In fact, in 2020, the US stock, which is the S&P 500, came at 18.4% and dividend stocks was negative 4.6% a 23% difference across the two. So it matters where we were. On the right-hand side, you're looking at the different types of bonds. And you can see in the fourth quarter, the lower quality bonds that offer higher income did well. Why? Because again, it was finally time to get comfortable with taking risks. Again, that vaccine offering hope and thus causing anything that had the word risk attached to it, whether it's stock or lower quality bonds, did better. So now that we've gotten a snapshot of the fourth quarter in 2020, let's take a look at the full year by taking a preview back all the way from the first quarter down into the fourth quarter, as well as the year to date, meaning all of 2020 recap. There's a lot of lines on here, so what are they? First of all, the green bars represent the different stocks around the globe. And the blue bars represent the different bonds around the globe. What are the different shades of colors? The darkest green bar is US, the middle shade uh, color is Europe, and then the lightest shade is going to be emerging markets, so think India, China, et cetera. And you can starting in a Q1, that's the first three months, which we don't want to remember, but let's just take a quick jog down memory lane. You can see there was no place to hide other than US government bonds. And that's the only place we found uh, some positive returns up 3%, but everything else fell. In the second quarter, so the next three months, March through the end of June, we saw everything rise. And this is where I'll talk about why this happened. Why did we see such a sharp turnaround? But nonetheless, second quarter, the markets recovered. It continued in the third quarter. And in the fourth quarter, we saw that rotation where emerging markets and European stocks did better than U.S. stuff for the first time after a very long time. As the same thing, international bonds did better than U.S. bonds. I'm going to stop on the year to date, and I want to bring a few nuggets to, to bring home the gravity of 2020. In 2020, the U.S. stock market, as represented by the S&P 500, which is the most commonly used stock market index, hit 18.4%. During the year, it made 
32 new all-time highs during the year. If you're sitting there with your jaw open, it took me a while to digest, given everything that we have experienced, that the stock market generated 32 new all-time highs, and then ended at 18.4%. Even still, you can see emerging markets did better than U.S. markets, and up 18.7%. Why? If you think of China, which is the epicenter of where the COVID crisis began, was in fact one of the first countries that was able to control the spread of COVID, and as such, its manufacturing came back to break even far sooner than the developed countries like Europe and US did. And as such, their equity markets in the region were one of the best performing, pushing emerging market equities as a whole to outperform the US in 2020. But this is something we often, we often talk about stocks. So stocks are interesting, you know these companies, but this was a great year for bonds. In a year like 2020, where stocks generated nearly double-digit returns, we had bonds generate 7.5 to 10%, depending on where you were. This is extremely unusual. You think of the relationship between stocks and bonds, and it's like a seesaw. One goes up, the other comes down. Guess what happened in 2020? Both went up. Very unusual. And we'll talk about why that is. And there's a big elephant called the, it starts with an F, and with a D, and it's not the bad word, but it's Fed. The Fed did something in 2020 that made the markets behave the way it did. And I'll explain more in a second. But 2020 as a whole, phenomenal year for stocks and bonds on the same page. So, as we look forward, what are some perspectives that we can glean? I'm going to look at the market impact as well as the portfolio impact. Let's start with the market impact. How do we describe 2020? There was so much that took place. And I think we thought about the best way to describe 2020 and the COVID economy and the recovery using this K letter. And in fact, it's very simple. Follow the red arrow down. That's the shutdown. This is not a slowdown. This is a complete shutdown. It shut down. Thereafter, we reopened. But did we reopen all the way? No, we reopened partially. So that's the green bar that follows the, the back end of the K. Thereafter, you can see there were a big divergence in the economy and the stock market. Things that were online that could benefit from consumption as we have shifted to things like Zoom or go to webinar. How many of you knew what Zoom was prior to 2020? It was not exactly a commonly known thing, but in 2020, online businesses certainly benefited as a result of the, the social distancing we all had to practice. Residential real estate, given low supply, and all of you in California certainly know Residential real estate has been on a tear up and low interest rates did very well. In general, stock markets did very well and any technology related company that could benefit from us as consumers socially distancing did well. On the other hand, take a look at any retail brick and mortar store. Those did not do well because we weren't going into those stores and those investments and sectors suffered. Similarly, Commercial real estate, many office spaces were left empty, and as a result, their prices fell dramatically in 2020. So big difference in where you were in the market. Similarly, valued stocks or dividend stocks, they were not in favor because, not because those companies were unhealthy all of a sudden, because companies, the stock market, paid forward for where they think the benefit is going to be. And they saw in the pandemic technology companies doing better than, let's say, an Exxon, which is going to not do as well given the environment we were in. So it mattered where you were. So this K shaped economy versus market is the best way to describe 2020 COVID impact and then the recovery. That takes us to the next slide. Let's see, is it moving? That takes us to the stock market. And the stock market, if any one of you were wondering and scratching your heads as to why it is just rising 
one, the economy seems to be in the doldrums at points. It's because of the chart on the left-hand side. The chart on the left-hand side looks at the Federal Reserve in that it controls the short-term interest rate. The Fed came in in 2020 and cut rates down to zero in a very short time. We compare it to the last two recessions, the great financial crisis and the tech bubble. So you can see the difference. Last time they took a little longer, and this time they were very fast. But what you don't see on the left-hand side chart is the Fed did something else this time. They spent $3.6 trillion in a matter of 60 days. Remarkable, remarkable that that's how much money they spent. In fact, in 2008, they spent roughly that entire amount over two to three years. So this was a very truncated amount of time where the Fed pumped in enormous amounts of liquidity slash money. Think of it this way. If there is a giant buyer in the store saying, don't worry, I'll buy anything in your store, it's going to drive prices higher. That is what you're seeing impacted on the right-hand side. As a result, the S&P 500 fell 34% from February high to the bottom. That's what you're seeing, that negative 33.9 from peak to the worst it saw, but then came back and recovered to break even in 128 days. Just to compare for kicks, in 2008, it took nearly 1,400 days, and in 2000, 1,800 days. In other words, if someone's doing mental math, four and a half months in 2020 to break even in comparison to four and a half years in 2008. The Fed made a big impact, and that's what you're seeing here, extremely unusual. However, when you look at the stuff inside the stock market, not all stock contributed the same. In fact, I have a little, I don't know if people can chat. Is there a chat function here? I want to do a little quiz um, and send in your answers, and I want to see you know, who guesses closest to correct. In 2020, despite the S&P 500 generating 18.4%, any guesses on how many stocks had negative returns in 2020 in the S&P 500. What's the number? Out of the 500, how many stocks in the S&P 500 had negative returns in 2020? I don't know how we can see if they can put this information in or share it. I'm, I'm curious to see what people's perceptions are. So maybe in the Q&A, someone can shout it out, and we'll see who comes closest to the number. But in 2020, where we saw there was a very narrow leadership. So let's take our eye to the left-hand side. You'll see six stocks, all technology stocks. We call them Fanima, but what does the Fanima stand for? Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Amazon, Microsoft, and Alphabet, which is Google's parent on the stock company. These six stocks generated nearly 58% in returns. That's that big blue bar you see sticking up. The other 494 stocks generated a 15% return. So you can see six versus 494. But next to it on the far left-hand side, there's a contribution, meaning the S&P 500 is what we call the market cap weighted index. The bigger stocks in the index have a bigger chunk in it. So as these companies grow in price, they have a more higher impact on the returns of the stock market. So these six stocks in the S&P 500, out of the 18.4, generated 12.2. The other 494 tried as hard as they could, tried and tried, but only came up with 6.2. In other words, six stocks generated two-thirds of all returns in the S&P 500 in 2020, and the balance, 494, generated the other one-third very concentrated, very narrow in 2020. This was not an event isolated to the U.S. stock market. We can see the same thing happening in the international equity market. The international equity market, as measured by the All Country World Index, that's at ACWI, ex-U.S., meaning ex-United States, that's a much bigger index, by the way, nearly 1,248 stocks. So bigger index than 500 in the U.S. We took the top 20 stocks in the international equity market 
and did the same exercise. And you can see the top 20 stocks on their own generated nearly 48% in return. The other 1,228 stocks generated 14. When you look at the contribution, 20 stocks drove as much as 50% of the return alongside the rest of the 1,228. So 2020 as a whole was very narrow in its leadership. What does this mean for you? Unless you as an investor were passively invested in these indices and or the active stock manager that you had had just these six stocks, your returns are not going to look like what you hear on TV and or in newspapers because no manager is just going to buy six stocks. In fact, you should fire that manager that just buys six stocks. But that's what we saw happen in a year that was controlled primarily by the pandemic, favoring these technology names relative to the rest of the market. However, another lesson we learned is that no trend persists forever. While we saw this event take hold, it was primarily coming from the first nine months. The first nine months of this year, where we didn't know what the end to this COVID crisis looked like until the vaccine came through, these six stocks basically beat out the other 494 stocks. Look on the left-hand side, from January through September, these six stocks came up with nearly 44% in return, and the other 494 were measly 2%. Big difference. But look at it from September to December. That news of the vaccine completely turned around the trends that were developing. And this is where, again, no trend persists into infinity and likely instead of trying to chase what is winning, we'll probably take a much more diversified approach helping benefit from both of these trends alongside. The same we saw on the right-hand side, we compare small stocks, as I mentioned, really struggled in the first nine months. We're down by nearly 21% in comparison to the stocks in the S&P 500, the big stocks. But for the last three months, the news of the vaccine allowed us to hope that the economy could reopen and some of these smaller stocks that were struggling could benefit. And we saw 31% come back in the fourth quarter, but just not enough to beat out the, the return trends that we saw for the year to date. So a lot of information so far, but the big takeaway for 2020 was that we had, while the stock market made its recovery, not all stocks participated in that recovery. So let's go to 2021, right? And here we are in 2021. I'm going to start with 2021 is going to be the year of hope. It is the year of recovery. The vaccine distribution will allow the broader economic recovery to take hold. But that I look at it in the sense that the vaccine is a light at the end of the tunnel. But we're still in the tunnel in the sense that the vaccine distribution is likely going to take some time and thus, as we come through the tunnel, that first quarter economic, economic growth is likely to struggle because we haven't seen the economy fully reopen. So you can see here we look at the forecast for economic growth in the U.S., in Europe, and in the emerging markets within China, India, etc. And you can see in, the, in 2020, all economies were in the red. It fell. There was no part in the global economy that had, uh, outside of China, on a sole country basis, many of the broad economies struggled in 2020. In 2021, we certainly see the economies coming back and creating significant growth and a lot of pent-up demand. We've seen a lot of cash on the sidelines, as well as a lot of pent-up demand. I don't know if you can see, but I know one thing that my husband and I said, I'm looking forward to having a dinner in a restaurant at some point and not having to worry about, you know, what's happening around us. And I think that type of uh, desire exists broadly across the globe, which will create a, a fairly big push for economic growth. So 2021 remains the year of hope. But I also want you to notice, where do you see bigger growth happening? in the U.S. or abroad. And likely, given the trends we have seen over the last 10 years, we think there's likely going to be a rotation towards other parts of the country going forward. Are you able to hear me? I 
I can't hear you, Nathan. It's uh, just your audio. Am I not coming through? Oh, you're back on. No, it was just the internet connection. You're good. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> internet. No, no, please stop me. If, if you can't hear me, definitely let me know because I, as much as I like talking to myself, uh, it, it's no fun doing it on video. Get to now go now. Gotten, thank you. Now that we've gotten a sense for what the market did, where, where are the opportunities and risks, and how does this impact your portfolio? So let's pivot to the next section. And the very first place I'll begin with, the start of the year, just as we typically go to the doctors to do a checkup, is a great time for you to revisit with Nathan to see how your portfolios are shifted. We had a wild ride in 2020, and likely your portfolios have shifted as a result. And one of the things that we have seen and this is a study that was done across 4,000 different advisors around the country, and we looked at the stock allocation in the portfolios, uh, and noticed that in the U.S., no surprise, we have a home country bias. So it's a, it's a very specific group called a home country bias, meaning we buy stocks in the country we live in. So you can see on the left the pie charts that are shown on the left-hand side. The average U.S. investor has 76% of their portfolio in U.S. stocks and the balance in stocks abroad. But when you look at the global stock makeup, U.S. stocks make up only 55% of your portfolio and the balance comes from international. Meaning if you have this very myopic view into the U.S. stock market, which is done very well, you're essentially leaving half the opportunity set on the table. So, so let's take a look at how our portfolios are positioned. Another trend we have seen in generally in the market has been a lean towards lower quality bonds as investors are searching for yield. I mean, we know interest rates are at bottom, rock bottom. And so investors have made a, a stretch to find income in their portfolios. And you can see in just two years, we have seen the increased allocation to lower quality bonds go up by nearly 10%. It's a fairly big increase. So it, it matters how your portfolio is positioned. So what are some opportunities? One opportunity that we think exists going forward is an international market. Now, I often get the pushback going, but U.S. stock markets, they've done so well here. Yeah? Why would I buy international stock? Because when you look at the stock market, so look at this chart here. There's lots of data on here. But if you take your eye to the bottom, you'll find the U.S. stock market and the international stock market performance. I have no doubt the U.S. stock market by looking at the index, has trounced the international stock market. But that's only part of the picture. When I look from 2011 onwards, where this phenomenon has been taking place, where U.S. stocks have done better than international stocks, in each of those years, we looked at the top 50 stocks and noticed that 75% of the time, each year, the top 50 stocks come from outside the U.S. In other words, there is opportunity and you need to look beyond the indices and perhaps an active manager that knows these stocks by name and can make those selections could be beneficial within your portfolios. So again, an important lesson for an investor is to not just look at the headline returns, but look underneath the hood and evaluate where opportunities exist. Here's one such example to highlight that. Another lesson we have learned in 2020 is, and I think, you know, this is where I get a lot of those questions. Should I buy Bitcoin? Should I be buying Tesla? Is it down 600% this year? What's the next hot thing I should purchase? What we have seen is that buying last year's winners is not exactly a winning strategy. So we made up a makeshift portfolio. This is not a real portfolio here. But what you see here is each year, we stacked the top performing investments and then to the worst performing. We made this little quilt chart here is what we call it. Right? It looks like a quilt. First you'll notice there's no pattern. There is no consistent winner. That's the first pattern you're going to notice because the, the little tiles are all over the place. The next thing we did was we said, well, what if we made a pretend portfolio and bought last year's loser? And we took that money and we rolled it. And then the next year we bought the last, you know, the same, the last year's loser. And each year rolled that portfolio over time. Notice the difference on the bottom. 
the cumulative return by buying last year's winner is not so great. You end up losing money. But if you bought the loser, in other words, if I hung on to my portfolio and remain diversified, then look at your cumulative return. The difference is negative 6.4 over those years versus 223%. Did it just move? Okay, sorry about that. And you can see, again, a lesson for all of us to learn, that there is no clear winner consistently. And secondly, investing is more about taking a longer term scope and having all of these varied elements in it. And then this is my final slide. And in the final slide, there's three line charts here. We look at the global stock market. We look at a globally diversified 40% in stocks, 60% in high quality bonds, and a 60% in bonds, 40% in high quality bonds. So three different portfolios, different mixes here. We look at it from a 2020, they all fell. But which one came back to break even first? It's not the stock market, even though it had tremendous returns. It's that portfolio was 40% in stocks and 60% in bonds. The second one to break even was 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds, likely where many of us are invested. And the last one to break even was global stock. It certainly went on to beat all the other portfolios, but sometimes the simple lesson is don't try and dig a big hole. Because when you dig a big hole, you got to dig further out. Diversification is that lesson. Try not to dig a big hole. Because when you dig a big hole, you've got to climb further out of the hole. And 2020 is a humbling lesson for all of us to remember that. That part of investing is not about finding the next sensational investment, but rather keeping a steady allocation that lets us sleep at night and meet our long-term goals. With that, that marks the end of my prepared slides, sir, Nathan. Let me see if I can stop sharing. I don't know how to do that. Is there a way to do this? You're, you're good. I'll switch over the panelist here. I'll put it back, back on mine, and then we'll go over Q&A, and I'll answer. We got some questions in here. And while I'm doing that, Kezia, we got some answers here. Can you tell us the number for the the negative stocks that, that have It was 177 in stocks. 177 stocks in 2020 had negative returns in that 500 bucket oh. that we typically compare. I can't hear you, Nathan. 117, I'm sorry? 177. Oh. Can you hear me now? 177, yeah. All right, let me. Can you you hear me now, Kizia? I sure can. I'm seeing the slides flip through okay, backwards. Perfect. perfect. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Let me just grab some of these questions here. On you, you brought up Bitcoin, so we're gonna take the next five to ten minutes to go over some questions here. When we we bring up Bitcoin and you said, you know, we're watching the headlines. Well, can you tell us some of the, the pros and cons about that? I know the, the price is fluctuating. Can you give us some insight on there? Absolutely. If you think that when you talk about Bitcoin, you have to separate it into two categories. One is the cryptocurrency itself, and the other is the infrastructure within which the cryptocurrencies are trading. And that has real life value, the underlying infrastructure. Imagine if credit card transactions all happen simultaneously, all these costs and benefits all happening online. That's very separate, but we tend to talk about both of these things together, and they're not. Cryptocurrency, and Bitcoin is an example of a cryptocurrency, it has pros and cons. But at the heart of why Bitcoin did as well last year was it believes that at some point, the U.S. as a company, as a country rather, has taken on so much debt that the U.S. dollar is going to be worth nothing. That's the crux of why Bitcoin is doing well. We just don't think that that is a baseline case, and it's not a realistic scenario, at least hopefully not in our lifetime. A good way to think of that is I ask 
clients all of this, this all the time. Would you be willing, if you got a paycheck, if you were working today, Nathan, would you be willing to accept your salary in Bitcoin? And likely the answer for where most clients and advisors would say, I'm not, no, that's something I do on the side. Showcasing that Bitcoin has a higher risk element to it and it's very speculative in nature. The other thing to think about, it is not a regulated investment at all. It's not an investment the way regulators look at this. And as such, carries a risk that we don't even know how the prices are generated. It is simply speculation on the up and downside driving this hysteria at times in the pricing. So knowing that, is, could you think of Bitcoin for some portion uh, on, in, on the side? Sure, but note that it is extremely speculative in nature. It assumes that the entire U.S. economy is going to be gone, which is why it's doing well. We really don't think that that's the baseline case, and it should not be a central component in you know, the average client's portfolios, but can be a speculative small component that you're curious to see about, absolutely. Good points. Okay, that answers the question there. Let me get a couple more here. Uh, here's a, a question right here as well. Can you give a little bit of insight on the, the active and tactical management? How does Asimar work with that and, and manage that within the portal? So there's a variety uh, of the category is very broad. So let me just make sure that I define active versus passive. And then within active, you can be tactical or not. So the, the, the category definitions can be quite vague. So let's define that. A passive investment is where you buy a replication of a broad index. As an example, the S&P 500 is an index. You can't have invest in it. The way to invest in it can be buying an ETF that replicates it. That's as close to passive as it gets. You're making no bets. You're simply buying what the index is. An active manager, to begin, can say, well, in the S&P 500, I don't like the energy sector because demand for energy remains low, as an example. And they may exclude that, thus making their portfolio look different than the index. That's active investing. Now, a tactical manager could be more active, to so take ta active and dial it up. That's how I think of it. So a tactical manager has the flexibility to say, in the next six months, I can see some companies, like as an example, in the first half of 2020, some of these technology companies benefiting. So they're leaning even more heavily. And then in the second half, they may pull back and say, guess what, I like China and what they're doing so we can pull into China. That's the difference in terms of passive, active to tactical. It's a spectrum from investing and its style. Each of it has its merit, and as asset mark, we believe in blending these. It's not a one or the other, but rather a combination to get us the right risk and return tolerance. So many of our managers can take a passive allocation and add a tactical element to it and blend that into a portfolio, likely some of the elements that you're using, Nathan. I want to make sure I answer the heart of the question that you were looking at, uh, and or do I need to clarify something? And that's what I shared. No, that's that's spot on. We the video stuff it we get 95% of it, which is good. I think that answers the question right here. Uh, we'll we'll take one more, and then I'm just going to summarize this. In, in regards to inflation, you know, we brought up, you know, dining eventually, you know, there's a, a pent up demand. How do you see prices on food or even maybe our prices in our local restaurants? Do you see those maybe going in the upward direction? So I'm going to talk about inflation a bit more generally um, and then related to the specific areas that you talked about. So let's take a step back because I think something has happened in 2020 um, where likely it's going to have an impact on inflation on down the road. Inflation has been non-existent by the way the, uh, the Fed measures it. Right? I know we all feel differently, but my prices are going up. But as the Fed measures food and oil prices, et cetera, inflation has been very, very low. In fact, the Fed has a target of 2% inflation. And over the last 10 years, 
we haven't even come close to hitting that 2%. Therefore, in 2020, the Fed did something very interesting. It came out and made an announcement that instead of targeting 2% as a hardline number, they were going to average 2%. Well, but what does that mean? When you try to target an average 2%, when inflation has been running below 2%, how do you get to an average of 2? You've got to let it run above 2% before it gets to a 2. So it is pushing for inflation, and that tells me that, yes, if they are going to push for inflation, we're likely going to get some down the road. The other thing that they're doing is that they're spending an enormous amount of money. In 2020, for the very first time, our debt to GDP, the entire amount that we borrowed, is 100% the size of our economy. We haven't seen that since World War II. So that's a big difference, likely meaning that this amount of spending is going to show up in higher prices down the road. Why don't I think inflation is going to be an immediate concern? We don't think inflation is an immediate concern in general because of two main things. First, how many of us are able to go out there and demand higher wages? That environment is not existent today. I know, Nathan, you're going to send a raving review soon after this webinar, but nonetheless, that doesn't help me get that, you know, the raise that I deserve. And that's likely a consistent story as unemployment remains elevated Wage growth, which is the number one driver of inflation, is non-existent. And so that keeps a downward pressure on inflation. So that's one. The other thing is that once the, the economy currently is extremely closed off, until we have a broadening economic recovery, when these restaurants can open, you're not likely to see restaurants aren't going to increase their prices overnight because they want to attract business to close the hole they had dug in 2020. So hence in the near term, inflation is likely to remain low, but 18, 20, four months onward, that's when we're more concerned about it. So it was a very long-winded answer, but I wanted to connect where we have been, where we are today, and what our forecast is and so likely inflation, not a near-term risk in our side, but much more of an intermediate to longer-term risk. Very good. Well, perfect. Well, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Uh, thank you, everyone, for writing in your questions. And Casey, as always, thank you. We'll, we'll hope to see you in person, hopefully later this year or, or sometime next year. So we, we always love having you. So. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll close out and uh, wish everyone a good day. So appreciate it. Kezia, thank you everyone on the call today. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Take care.